the Grozio Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission meeting. The time is 7.36. I call this meeting to order and ask everyone to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Flag to the United States of America, public for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible. Oh. Welcome, everybody. Looks like uh, you know we have uh, three excused absences this evening from uh, Al as well as Jenny. Um, so other than that, we're a full roster. Uh, you should have uh, an agenda before you. Is there any additions or deletions to the agenda as presented? Jane's usually got something, so I'm waiting a little while. Brian, you got a copy of that? Uh, yeah, we should have some extra copies. Yes, I, I put it under pathway hazards. Thank you, Jane. It'll be a bunch of brochure, a you know, bunch of information. So if you're missing something, just let me know, Tom. Okay. Hearing none, move on. You know what the agenda is presented. Um, I had on here for approval of meeting minutes, but since Al is not here, do not have a copy of the. Uh, April meeting minutes when we met last, so we can um, you know, postpone those until our next meeting. Now it's time to open public comment. Uh, seeing nobody in the audience here tonight, I will move straight into some of the public comments that we got via email. So uh, the first one you should have uh, actually a brochure about was uh, about um, you know, East River and Park Lane. Uh, Mr. Robert uh, Guerlamo, I apologize if I'm butchering his uh, name over here, uh, you know, emailed me as well as I uh, talked to uh, Lorinda uh, over at DPS because uh, he and his wife were out riding and they're on East River down near the southern end and his wife unfortunately met a pothole and flipped over the handlebars. So, yeah, uh, luckily, you know, she's okay. Um, no... no uh, long-term damage, but you know, it's enough that uh, you know, he wanted to make sure that, you know, if possible, that Grozio could you know, try and you know, step up its game and try and you know, work on some of these potholes. He'd also mentioned that on Park Lane in several locations, there was lots of roadway debris that uh, you'd have to dodge. And so, um, you know, again, you know, it's about maintenance stuff. So I, uh, first of all, you know, commended him for you know, letting us know about these issues, that we always appreciate that. You know, whether e email or seeing one of us in person or you know, uh, letting anybody else know at the township, we always need to know about what the problems there are out there so that way we can address them. Uh, you know, secondly, uh, I told him that he contacted the right person with Lorinda since it is the roadway network, that they are responsible for that. And I'll let him know that we're also you know, looking into options for increased uh, you know, maintenance, especially on East River. Bob, I believe that you know, you've been... It's a pet project of yours is trying to get increased street sweeping in order to make sure that the shoulder is in better condition. Um, but I also did, you know, let uh, him know that uh, unfortunately some of this is a, a funding issue, uh, being that for one, you know, uh, Grozeal does not own any roadways. You know, we are a township, so we are a creature of Wayne County government. All the roads except for those that are private um, are owned by Wayne County, and so we are subject to what they want to do with their funding. And of course, like all other local governments, you know, county government, state government, even you know, the federal government, uh, you know, there is a, a lack of funding available for infrastructure, uh, you know, especially with roadways. So uh, you, know, you see it quite often that there's a lot of potholes around uh, the entire metropolitan area. And some of the things that actually make Grozeal a great place to b walk and bike, meaning that it's low traffic volumes along the roadways, low speeds, no real connections to you know, other surrounding areas, meaning that we don't have you know, large trunk line roadways, it also puts us at a negative, uh, you know, at a disadvantage for when it comes for roadway funding. Because if you have a limited pot of money, you want to get the most bang for your buck as far as, you know, you know, doing triage with the network. So, uh, you know, Wayne County, uh, you know, is, you know, you know, first and foremost, you know, fixing and re I should say restoring 
uh, you know, roadways that have lots of commercial traffic and have lots of population centers. So in the downriver area, you can think of roads like North Line, Eureka, Sibley, Pennsylvania. A lot of those mile roads, those are owned by Wayne County. And, uh, you know, they're going to make sure that, you know, with their limited funding that those do get you know taken care of because of the amount of traffic that's on there additionally uh you know there's a, lo a lot of other efforts you know across the entire county so when you think of western wayne we think of canton van buren township and you know a lot of those mile roads as well uh there you know unfortunately there's not enough money to go around and so from what we've heard in the past is that uh, wayne county will be come out and fill potholes but as far as getting a, a brand new s roadway surface, um, those are gonna be few and far in between unless something changes. Um, that could be something at the federal level, that could be something at the state level, or it could be something here in, uh, with Groziel Township, because I know in the past that we have had roadway millages to help you know, f um, restore some of those roadways, putting in a little bit more money to sweeten the pot and you know, have uh, Wayne County uh, redo some of our roadways. Unfortunately, that millage did not pass. Uh, it was probably about two years ago now. So uh, we were big advocates for that because we realized, you know, while it might not be dedicated pathway funding, you know, most of our roads are pretty bikeable to begin with if you take out the pavement in the equation. Um, so, uh, you know, we heavily lobbied for that. And unfortunately, and during that special election, it did not go through. But um, we encourage all Groziel residents to be advocates for better roads. And, um, you know, we can talk about that at the local level or, you know, wor working with our uh, state representatives or working with the county um, but you know we got to be more active if we really do want to increase the pavement along our roadways or whatever would that look I mean, it, it's good to, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the, the grease, or in this case, you know, the, uh, the loud person gets the pothole filled. Uh, but um, again, we, we are talking about a funding stream where it, uh, all the, uh, the funding for our roads does not come from property taxes. So if, you know, you say, well, I pay a lot of property taxes, I should be getting my roads fixed. Not a single, you know, penny from our property taxes uh, goes to Wayne County specifically for the roads, with the exception if we do a roadway millage. So if we do a you know a local millage, then we have a property tax levy, and we can give that you know to Wayne County to help redo the roads. But um, on its own, you know, from the, the funding comes from the state and from the uh, the federal government through you know primarily the uh, the gas tax. So there's a state gas tax and there's a national gas tax. That money comes back. It's a specific formula. They have a set amount, and you know, unless something changes at the state level or at the federal level, Wayne County isn't going to be getting any more money for that. So we can complain and you know, and talk to Wayne County and try to ask them to reprioritize stuff, but it's kind of, I would just say, you know, they're going to have to take road, roadway money away from another community as well. So. Uh, in the end, I'm not sure if it would be the most efficient, but I think you know, we do definitely need to be politically active and, and talk to Wayne County, let them know that we need that, but also you know, figure out creative ways to help have more funding for capital improvements along the roadway. I think one thing we should do is because Wayne County has a lot of money to fix potholes, and it's just not as effective as a new technology which is called spray patching you know which uh, is a kind of a hot bituminous material that adheres to the sidewalls and it actually has a longevity of around you know 18 to 36 months depending on the the wear and tear of the roadway systems whereas coal patch really has a very limited life cycle within the pothole so that could be something that we could talk to them about but i've not seen them use spray patch on any of the other uh, townships throughout the the county you know uh, that would be something that the, that we would have the township would have to take out into itself and it really doesn't have the funding source to do that but it's something we could ask Swain County if they could look into yeah do you know of any other communities that are using you know, spray oh, a lot of a lot of uh, cities that own um, their roadways um, 
practically all the cities that own their roads use a spray patch because it is a long-term effective solution to, to potholes um, as opposed to uh, coal patching. You know, they use coal patching in the, in the winter months and then they spray patch in the summer because it requires the asphalt plants to be up and operational at that point through there. So. Does that provide any structural integrity? So I mean, I know a lot of times with the roadways we're, we're dealing with freeze thaw, but if basically it's kind of like a, you know, a, a roof for your house, if you do proper preventative maintenance, it's gonna last a long time, but if you let it go, you get water damage in there and it starts to you know, escalate the actual cost. And so uh, it costs more to fix it when you do it because you delayed it. So um, I know from previous experience that uh, you know roadways can be the pavement can be classified on a scale of one to ten a pacer reader sure. and you know basically you know about a, a third of the way down we're getting into structural problems and once you get into structural problems you have to replace the entire roadway rather than just talking about the top levels so i'm wondering you know potholes themselves they don't i mean a pothole patch it doesn't really have any structural integrity to it it's just like you said it's it's a band-aid it's a very quick fix uh, i was wondering you know how the spray patch relates you know compared to the pothole versus actually doing some sort of you know seal coating and you know uh taking off the top layers and you know does it have any uh, structural integrity and then secondly what's the cost difference between them uh, with regard to the structural integrity, it does have structural integrity if, if the balance of the roadways is fairly intact. So those roads that are kind of mid to fair, but you have a pothole here and there, through there, it'll really do a wonderful job of actually improving the rideability of it. And, and the real difference is because it actually adheres to the sidewall of the uh, pothole with a tack coating through there and it is a hot bituminous mix uh, that has aggregate within it mm -hmm. it kind of um, does a very good job at sealing that and it will improve the quality of the roadway dramatically for up to you know two to three years depending on the travel lanes if the road is in has a structural deficiency though it, it, it won't work it needs a good sidewall mm -hmm. to to adhere to and of course, the size of the pothole can't be enormous. You know, if the size is more than about 12 inches across, 12 to 14 inches across, it's it's a little bit beyond its useful technique. You know, at that point through gotcha. there, it is um, it is much more. It's more. I wouldn't say much more expensive, but it's more expensive than um, coal patch. But the difference is that you put it down once and you don't have to come back to it for 24 months. Mm -hmm. So when you take the aggregate cost of continually going back through there, I've never really looked at that type of analysis, but it would, over the uh, amortization of the maintenance of it, I would think that it would be cheaper than actually coal patch through there. Might be something to talk with Lorinda about. Yeah, I'll talk to Lorinda about it. But we, I also work in other townships and it's the same situation. The county, it, it's not that they, they use spray patch in one community and not in another. They just don't don't use it. But the cities are going out and buying it because they know that they need to increase the longevity of their roadways. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, another item, you know, and sorry, you know, creative solutions since you, um, it's been probably like a year or two since it's been out there. And Tom, you might be able to help me out as well. Uh, you know, talking about this, and then um, John, you might be familiar with it too. But uh, I know that there is a, a different type of pavement that you can put down on the roadway uh, that was done out here on Grow Road a few years ago. Um, that's generally done for more rural areas with light traffic, as opposed to uh, you know county trunk line roads. And so, uh, Grozeal Township had to get uh, you know a request to experiment with it. And I'm forgetting the actual name of the the, the type of pavement it is Chips, right yeah. now. Chip it's called Chip Seal, and okay. it's used out throughout the, the state of Michigan. Wayne County was the only county that didn't literally didn't use it. We had to get uh, approval for it. Um, it it can only be put down on a roadbed that's in relatively good shape to begin with. Gotcha. If there's lots of potholes. In fact, there were roads that we had been on the initial list. Uh, by the time we got approval, uh, we couldn't do it any longer because they had deteriorated, you know, that much. But the chip seal, uh, it's used out, you know, throughout Michigan. If you if you mill the surface of the road and then put it down, it's it's even more uh, has a longer life to it. 
but it's a you know it's a tenth of a cost of, of putting down a, a you know replacing a roadbed, mm -hmm. and it will extend the life. Um, unfortunately, it's all it all comes down to money. Yeah. Well, what they've done there a couple of years ago, there they did a horse mill, East River, uh, other places. Wonderful job. I mean, it did. What it right at first, it was a little grainy, mm -hmm. uh, but after use and the you know compressing of the, of the you know the the automobile tires, uh, it's it's created a real nice surface and it's prolonged the life life of those roads. Like I say, unfortunately, from the when we started the project. Uh, by the time we got approval, it was too late in the, in the season. It has, it has to be a certain temperature out there. And uh, so by the following year, some of the roads just had deteriorated uh, to the point we couldn't, we couldn't do it. Uh, church. <laughs> yeah, well, church is for, for sure. <laughs> Undermining. Um, but I remind you, if, if you do see a pothole in the road, uh, if you call DPS and ask for John Keim, uh, John Keim does have uh, some limited access of a cold patch, and he will come out, and he'll fill the hole for us. It's it's short term, but uh, you know, uh, for that you know, as soon as possible, you get that in there. At least you get you through the summer. Mm -hmm. By by the next winter, it'll be it'll all be gone. Yeah. But uh, you call it call John Kime at DPS, and uh, he'll do his best to get out there and fill that hole for you. Gotcha. Other number, um, and I did include this with a uh, uh, person that sent the email, uh, there is a Wayne County number in order to report potholes. And I've done this plenty of times on Jefferson and on my drive home from Detroit. <laughs> but uh, that, that number is one eight 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 seven six two two three. 762 Sorry, I'm butchering this over here. one eight 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 seven six two three two seven three. And you know, uh, maybe I'll try and put that on Grozeal walks and bikes, just that way people know about that. I don't if, think if you do call John, uh, give him give him the location, and if there is an address, if it's in front of a house, give him the address of the house. Uh, there's so many potholes, <laughs> he may very well fill the the one that you know, <laughs> thinking he was doing the one for you. But yeah, give him a landmark or, or an address that he can uh, identify with, and he'll do his best to. Uh, Throw some cold patch in here for the immediate uh, fix. Awesome. One with a broken bike next to it. <laughs> with a broken, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad to see a, a citizen finally, uh, besides, came actually and sent a little thing on this thing about my little pet peeve, and that's that I call it a share lane, but I, I guess it, at one time it had to be put in to put in a water line from um, Manchester down to almost Gray's up towards the middle school. And it's a six foot wide, but I call it a share lane, but it isn't. It belongs to Wayne County. Would we love to see that swept? Absolutely, yeah, because it, it can be used as a sidewalk share lane. To ask Wayne County to come over here and sweep it, not gonna happen. Do we have a sweeper? Yes. Well, oh, they're gonna, I don't know, they're gonna give us a ticket for sweeping their share, or their little lane there six foot wide on east river i think it needs to be cleaned at least every quarter gotcha uh, so it sounds like we you know we can touch base with lorinda on you know the sweeping about you know the spray patch as well yeah. as the chips lorinda does a wonderful job she truly does really does maybe get um backing advocate to bring the broom and then we do it manually <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's it's possible. I can step that up. Maybe you can say, hey, just like um, the Nature Conservancy, they get together and clean the beach. Why don't we get together and sweep? This is an idea. Well, you know, they have that annual uh, island cleanup in the spring. That could be put maybe on that agenda. That's a thought. At the same time. And between us, them and us, we could maybe get something going. So we at least need, you know, once a month to, to get that swept, you know. Once I don't think it's been swept in years, gotcha. but it'd be nice to see. <laughs> I'd be happy every quarter. <laughs> cool. Well, any other questions about this lively topic on maintenance? <laughs> I know we could talk about this all yes, day, but you know we should we, uh, get on. So I don't hear anything about specific to our uh, one uh, public comment over here. I'll move on to the other public comments. Public comment was going to take so long today. Um, Second item is about a, a bench location. So again, you should see, uh, have a handout before you from uh, Cheryl Yuckham, and uh, she was asking for a bench on Horse Mill uh, on the section of the bike path between uh, Meridian and Thoroughfare. 
So she's saying that uh, her or uh, you know, other folks that she knows, uh, one diabetic, diabetic walker has difficulty making it all the way to the bench near the canal. So I was wondering if you know, we'd be able to put a, a bench you know, halfway between or you know, somewhere around there. So I, I did, you know, first of all, you know, thank her for her suggestion. You know, again, we're always looking for suggestions. And uh, let her know that uh, you know, we ourselves do not you know, have funds for installing that, but we do regularly get requests for you know, people that want to make donations for benches and for other items and are looking for locations as well as you know, design criteria. So I told her that you know, we would put that on our list, and so that way if there is some uh, you know, generous person that does want to uh, put in a, a bench, we can make that as a, uh, a suggestion as a place for it to be put it in the, in the future. What's a ballpark? Oh, that's a good question. And I know, don't hold me to it, but I, I believe it's probably around, you know, close to $1,000 for the bench. And like the more expensive option is that the concrete that we'd like to have it set on. So uh, one of the problems, you know, we've had so, so many success stories with benches, you know, great people that have, you know, generously donated money to have a bench al along the path or other parts of the island but um, that's only one half of it you know we have to still mow the grass in that area and so dps has to get out there and physically move the bench uh, oftentimes they put it right on the path in order to you know cut the area and sometimes they forget to put that back um, so you know then we get into more liability or you know safety concerns from that standpoint so I, I know that there is at least you know a best practice moving forward that we want to try and have a concrete slab underneath the bench and so that can be you know one to two thousand dollars as well I know that we had uh, some generous people from the uh, beautification committee in the past that uh, did do a lot of the bench work and uh, they go out and buy the materials themselves and actually put down the uh, the concrete and save some money rather than having a contractor do it but I know I'm definitely not proficient in that front and I prefer to have somebody that you know specializes in that in order to do it so um, yeah, unfortunately it does cost money but you know hey it's only money we can there's a will there's a way um, the other item I have uh, under open public comment uh, was from uh, Miss Pam Frucci who has you know talking to her and uh, item two on our agenda over here but you know she did mention a, uh, a path suggestion uh, bit, and it happens to be one that's on our list already so she was talking about uh, the right-of-way uh, along Grozio Parkway between Meridian and the free bridge and so we commonly refer to that as the chicory to hickory because you could uh, use Chicory Road and Hickory Road as and uh, put a potential boardwalk uh, in this back area that generally uh, gets flooded once or twice a year and that way you have a nice more comfortable uh, pathway in order to connect to the uh, Meridian Trail as well as you know get to the free bridge so she just put that out there and I told her that is something that you know it's been talked about for years and you know hopefully in the future that we might be able to examine that more work with the local you know, property owners to see if that's a possibility as well as tr try and find funds for it so she was excited to hear about that uh, and the last um, public comment and Tom I believe uh, you sent this to me via text message that there was somebody that was talking specifically about a, a stop sign missing on uh, uh, the pathway close to yeah, down here by the airport was Bunker. it Manchester? Or? Uh, Bunker. One, there was one, I think, one missing at uh, at, at Manchester, and I was told I'm Ruck, this is just Rucker. what was passed on, and then the the ones at Rucker, okay, were missing, okay, or non-existent. So, gotcha. Well, it's definitely good to know about those, and we can talk a little bit more about stop signs <clears throat> and signs in general and later on the uh, agenda. So. Um, that's the end of the, the public comment that I heard about during throughout the month. Seeing nobody else here, I'm going to close public comment and move on to the rest of the agenda. Um, next item is the Grozio Grand. Uh, for those of you not in the know, we do have a new newspaper here on the island. Uh, it's supposed to be both a, a hard copy as well as an online publication. It's called the Grozio Grand. And I did get a phone call from uh, Ms. Pam Frucci, who's going to be writing articles about stuff that's going on, on the island, and she wanted to know more about the bike paths and more about BPAC. So 
I uh, you know had a you know a good conversation with her for about you know ten minutes or so, and you know let her know about some of the initiatives that we're doing, and you know wanted to really let her know about uh, the lazy rides and the, the glow rolls and the tour de eel, and you know give a little primer about how we're on the Iron Belt Trail, and based on that, she said that you know she, this could probably be a, a recurring. Uh, article that she has and you know recurring theme for our article within the paper and so that way we can let them know exactly what's going on uh, on the island from an engineering and education and enforcement standpoint for all things bicycle and pedestrian so uh, look forward to you know, at least some of the information to be put in the next edition of the Grozio Grand which should be coming out here shortly um, and there might be more in the future as well Next item on the agenda is Island Fest debrief. Uh, I know Bob and Jane, you did a lot of hard work with you know, setting up the uh, the booth and talk with a lot of folks. Al was there quite a bit, as well. so I'm going to hand it over to you two to talk a little bit about what you might have learned from the Island Fest. Well, it's nice to see that everybody that lives here enjoys their bike paths. Um, they love the drinking fountain. Nothing but good things were said about it and the pass. Um, there was a few people that were concerned about some things, but other than that, it was all in all very positive. Uh, a lot of concern is the signaling on the path, and we've expressed this time and time again. If you're passing anybody, a pedestrian, whatever, signal, shout out, ring a bell, uh, do something. It startles a lot of the individuals that are walking along, and that was uh, emphasized quite a bit. One other thing that some people have noticed lately uh, motorized vehicles, well I shouldn't say vehicles, uh, skateboards on the bike path that are flying up and down. That's something we have yet to look into, but we will and address it as we see fit. But uh, other than that, it was a positive time about it all. How did you two feel about the, uh, the new location being on the path um, by our fountain? Well, everybody, <laughs> a lot of pedestrians walking their Walking the dogs and they get a drink and they love that. Uh, got to talk with a, a, a lot of individuals uh, uh, that weren't aware of our past, that weren't from here, you know. And we were able to get some feedback from them and what they thought of, you know, the area and coming here and stuff. But uh, uh, over there, uh, it was fine. It was good. Hey, any comments? I think after four years of being up the, under the hangar, everybody knew where we were, and I'm sure they were like, where do they go? Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of letting the public know. We're going to be at the drinking fountain over there with the police. So I think we need to promote a little bit more next year if we decide to go back to the drinking <coughs> fountain. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of nice, but I think we're kind of hidden behind the, the traffic. Yeah. But for the purpose of, of the drinking fountain location, I, it's a good place to be this year. Talk about this more later and decide if we would want to stay there versus being in the airport hangar. I'm sure there's advantages and disadvantages to both, but I guess um, we'll cross that bridge next year. Thank you, everyone that volunteered. Uh, next item on the agenda is something that Jane asked me to put on about advertising. I assume this is yeah. about uh, Facebook? Not only Facebook, I'm thinking more manual, more physical. Not everybody has Facebook, and sometimes when I post advertising in every store, sometimes the store owner will take the sign down or somebody will take it, so I, I feel like I'm wasting my time going to store to store to store. So we have talked about having a uh, why don't you maybe ask a Boy Scout, make it at the Eagle Project, and then you can put it in a centralized location, senior, after school programs and stuff. I was thinking, who's going to take care of it? Maybe one of us in the community could be responsible of um, getting a PDF or a flyers, and we will put them up for them. Mm -hmm. And we will approve or disapprove and put it on a bulletin board like. So when people walk by and they say, oh, what's going on? Because they don't have Facebook, they don't have computers, or don't know how to use it. Mm -hmm. So we need to get that going, maybe by next year. Okay, so talking about a kiosk. Um, it might be good you know, to talk with recreation about that, as well as with um, the beautification committee. 
I know you know Pam Frucci, this has been a, a big issue for her over the years is you know having some form of you know medium at the uh, she was always thinking about with the four corners so at Meridian and uh, Grozio Parkway but um I'm thinking that this should be much larger than BPAC. Um, there's issues that I've had, you know, over on the, on the planning commission side, where you know a lot of commu a lot of uh, property owners, both profits and nonprofits, the schools, they're looking for those dynamic, changeable signs, LED signs, so that way they can post about events. So I mean, there's a need to get the word out. Um, I don't know what the correct media format is for that. But uh, you know, if we are you know serious about the kiosk, I think it should be much larger than a BPAC effort. And you know, if we can figure it out, get uh, some uh, form of architect or engineer to you know come up with some designs, figure out where we want to do it. Perhaps this is something that we can apply for grant funding for. Um, you know, uh, from a, the DNR trust fund or the recreation passports or uh, maybe something specifically for Iron Bell Trail related. Uh, and that does remind me of something that I forgot to put on there is uh, the Downriver Linked Greenways uh, just received a uh, Iron Bell mini grant uh, and that's specifically for you know wayfinding signage throughout uh, all of the Downriver area. So uh, for those of you not familiar, the Downriver Linked Greenways is basically the uh, the metro parks you know south all the way to Flat Rock and then over from uh, you know uh, Flat Rock you know through uh, you know Gibraltar and then coming up through um, the Jefferson corridor so including Trenton and Grozeal and Riverview uh, Wyandotte River Rouge and Ecorse until you get into the city of Detroit um, so that's the spine of their network both at east west and north south routes but there's you know many other uh, you know more community connectors that the Downriver Link Greenways tries to get their hand in, and they're looking for something for all of the Downriver area, but also tying into the Iron Bell. So that might be an avenue for you know looking for you know more than just the um, the the pieces of paper, the flyers that you're talking about, but actually more you know wayfinding and branding for the the, the entire trail network. Uh, additionally, you know, we could be uh, sending information out to the DNR to let them know about uh, these events that are happening on the Iron Bell Trail. Yeah, Just some thoughts. When we invite the public come kayaking, um, mm -hmm. getting the biking stuff. Okay. Uh, and again, channels. I mean, I, I, that's always good to know about. Um, you know that that goes directly to people's homes, and that's you know a paper copy. And so, um, I, th I have to thank the the recreation department for allowing us to have our half page flyer. Uh, maybe in the future, you know, we can figure out you know some other avenues for some you know direct mailings or something of that nature. Okay. The subject of a uh, illuminated uh, signboard has been brought up, and the planning commission has turned down any. Uh, any thought of allowing one to go in so I would think if there was enough public um, demand <laughs> they might be able you know change their mind but it would certainly be a way of instead of a cluttered intersection you know be it uh, Meridian and Macomb or Parkway and and Meridian uh, where you have a the largest flow of traffic it would certainly be more appealing than a bunch of odd signs that uh, dis distract you. You can't read one, let alone a dozen. Yeah. But it, right at this point in time, the planning commission has turned that idea down. Mm -hmm. and serving on the planning commission, I've had a hand in that. But uh, okay, I, I can just say that it's not that uh, the planning commission is against the dissemination of information or even the signs themselves. It just I think part of the problem is finding what is a good fit for Grozeal and for a residential area. Uh, but also more so is finding out how, you know, basically once you grant these signs, because you can change the information all the time, how do you actually regulate that? So, you know, it's fine. Now if, you, you know, need somebody, you need a, a, a an employee dedicated yes. to maintaining what goes on, when it go, you know, when it comes off. Uh, yeah, that just but the brightness another. of it. I'm sure that folks have seen you know, the sign over the ga at the gas station at Jefferson, and uh, um, yeah. that's a little bright. That's a little bright. That, that, that's what we want to make sure we don't you know get exactly. ourselves into. Exactly. Um, 
the way I kind of put it is you know, almost like to see something that you know basically mimics a um, you know a real sign. Uh, and I gave the analogy of think of like the the Amazon Kindle, you know, like the 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 really I guess at this point dumb device where you know it was just you know a tablet that was black and white and it had you know text and you could read a book and it was basically a digital book if you could put it out in the sunlight it looked all the same but. Other than that, there's no real bells and whistles on it, nothing to distract you. Yeah, we've but all been it, blinded it by the, the ones on the expressway. Yeah. It was like <laughs> so, 10 miles away. Exactly. Um, so you know, if we can find something like that and you know, the township can figure out how to actually regulate it, you know, who is the person that actually regulates it? Who maintains uh, it. Yeah, who maintains it. Um, you know, there's there's cost involved with putting that in. You know, is it the only the uh, the people that you know decide to you know put money into that the capital improvements on you know for the sign that actually get to put their messages out rather than it being uh, you know, community wide. You know, anybody can submit anything and enter it. Uh, you know, there's just so much on the logistics side that uh, the planning commission did not feel comfortable with it. And you know, with the, that, uh, I believe the uh, admin. You know, township administration saying that they were not in favor of it as well. That kind of just sealed the deal. Like, okay, you've, we can come back to this later, but this time we're, you know, we didn't want to open that can of worms. It's just that, it just that when you get the cluster of, of signs of, you know, odd shapes and, you know, the messages are very, you know, a lot of times aren't clear. Uh, what's the, you know, they have no effect. At some point mm -hmm. in time, you just, you just blow on by. If there was one sign with uh, you know a message being up there for 10 seconds and and you know how many times would that message cycle i mean there's a lot i understand there's a lot of things involved it's just that the the little individual signs or a signboard that's placed 30 or 40 feet back from the intersection uh, and you hang a sign on it can you really read the message on that sign does it yeah. so does it serve a purpose yeah there's a lot of things to be discussed but this is the 21st century. <laughs> yeah. I think those electronic signs are the way to go and to get those across. But there's a lot of issues to be sure hammered you, out. Yeah. And you think about traffic safety. I mean, we're all distracted with you know a bunch of different things already, like in the car with the radios and with uh, you know, but they're, they're uh, pretty, kids. And they're they're everywhere, really. You know, you go down any yeah. roadway, you see, you know, but really started a lot of churches started it. You know, they really. Really Even ones, the, uh, really down other down river communities, look at uh, Carlton over here, or Gibraltar at the high school here. Uh, they got one out in front of there, and then over on Trenton on West Road at the hockey rink, there's one out in front of there. There's a lot of these devices everywhere. Yep. It's just that you have to make it fit for your community. Yeah, do we want a we want a thirty by sixty billboard out there? No, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not going to. Not happen. one you can see from space so, either. Yeah. <laughs> Again, not exactly in the the in BPAC's wheelhouse, but uh, if something comes out there where it's a partnership, you know, we'd be happy to put our information out there. Absolutely. Um, next item is uh, the tails donation. Um, so, Bob, I know you've been talking with Roberta about this a little bit, and maybe you can give a little bit of uh, the backstory to the folks that are uh, viewing this at home. Well, Roberta's ready, both feet on the ground and running, and she has the, the doggy boxes, I guess they're called, or whatever. We just have to, we were talking about putting them on existing uh, poles and things, and that would probably, I would imagine if we took a moment, uh, think about it, a, a, one, a stop sign, one of ours maybe, near where we have the gross seal uh, uh, trash cans and that. But uh, uh, anytime we're ready, and the, plus who, who's, who's gonna put them on? Mm -hmm. Is this something we get the DPS to do, Lorinda, you know? Yep. But uh, they're ready. And uh, we've got to touch base with them. So, uh, you know, Tom and I have uh, you know, talked a little bit about this offline, and you know, we were planning to, uh, well, I should say, you know, Tom was planning to you know, talk to to Lorinda about it. So, uh, it, it is something that you know we're we're looking into. And again, you know, we can't go out there and, and sell them ourselves. So, if she's in favor of that, and you know, she and she likes you know the suggestions of what we're talking about with you know being on a, an existing sign or you know close to the the trash cans i think we can do that um is there so, a, a number of of these you know is it is it six is it half dozen there's a dozen three dozen uh i guess it would be is what we deem you know i mean what do we think in uh every mile every half mile you know uh 
we would have to take uh, break it down. You know, if it's if it's every mile, then we only need what ten or so. Uh, she, she has no; they have no problem donating whatever. But wherever it will be attached or whatever it's attached to, they would like their uh, small donation label also mounted below it, uh, stating that it was donated by Tells. And will they be, uh, you know, p paying for all of that, or do we need to try and find some resources? Uh, I believe they'd be paying for all mm -hmm. that. So, I mean, I know offline we've talked about this, and it seemed like individuals are in favor of it. Um, yeah. I think again, a lot of details goes, boils down to, uh, you know, you know, the logistics with DPS, mm -hmm. uh, just to show our solidarity and you know, kind of have something to move forward. I'm, asking uh, for a vote just to say that you know we are in favor of it and you know uh, contingent on uh, you know DPS you know finding you know being able to uh, you know find the appropriate locations for the mm -hmm. uh, units I guess one of the questions would be um, could it be monitored on like one of the bike path uh, uh, stop signs at a, like at an intersection let's just say use Church and Meridian for an example because there is a trash can close right. by or would it have to be on its own in its own post, and do we have to install the post? So now it comes down to yeah. where where do you install it without? That's why we were talking about existing. Mm -hmm. But there are some areas like down Horse Mill. Uh, there, other than the stop sign, there's a, might be one sign, but uh, yeah. But there's very there's very at few. that point there's very few homes that it would be correct. You know, correct. The last thing you want is somebody taking a bag, filling it up, and just leaving it. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm really thinking, you know, maybe just start out small. So, like, you know, again, right. you know, once every mile, no, I wouldn't do any more than that. Yeah. Wheel it out, or uh, like you say, one every mile. Sounds good. So, yeah. Just for the, the record, can we? Oh, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I have a question. Would Taylor provide endless supply, or would only supply for five years of the poop bag? Mm hmm That's a good question. We should probably uh, touch base with uh, Roberta on that. Okay. Well, um, rather than calling a vote on that, we should probably get that information first. All right. Um, okay, it's not that big of a deal, but uh, we'll, we'll continue to work on that. Um, next item on the agenda is a summary of our vice Council pedestrian uh, sorry, I sh actually should have said uh, our, our path survey. So um, last month, in lieu of a actual you know, meeting te that was televised, we decided to um, have all the commissioners meet on the trail, and uh, we st met over at uh, uh, St. Thomas, and you know traveled north up to um, up to uh, you know, Bridge Road. And we started looking at the pathways, both from the signings perspective, from a traffic safety perspective, as well as pavement. So we kind of jotted down some notes. There's a lot of side conversations. And I had a lot of that up here. And I kind of uh, put together a quick presentation to kind of show some of the stuff that I thought that we did have some agreement on. So I'm going to move over to the uh, podium over there to, to operate this PowerPoint. <laughs> So we can see on the screen you know, all of the, the folks that were available and happy to be bike riding rather than being stuck in a stuffy uh, meeting room that evening. We had some great weather um, and lo lots of conversations. Uh, so you know, some of the first things that we talked about was that you know, with this section right at uh, Voigt, you know, just north of Bridge Road, the pathway ends. Uh, we have a bike route sign uh, over there that says that it ends. I, I understand that from a, a little standpoint but I, again it's kind of obvious it's you know that the route ends it's that the path actually ends rather than the route itself uh, if technically a route could continue on um, and you know there's a lot of you know nice sites north here on um, Meridian Road as it rounds up to you know, catch up with Park Lane uh, including some nature conservancy properties so I could see where the bike route actually goes on road rather than uh, being you know, a pathway at that point because of how light the traffic is north of Voight Road. 
Um, but another thing we saw was that there was no ADA detectable warnings. So oftentimes, you know, when you're on a sidewalk and you come upon a street, you look down, you, know, you have the, the ramp that goes into the street, and there's going to be these, these plastic little circles on the, uh, the concrete, and they're generally either red or yellow, and you can actually feel them you know, within your shoes. And what that is is a, you know, a detectable warning for folks with limited sight. Uh, you know, they could be blind or they just have low visibility to let them know that they're actually exiting a sidewalk or exiting a pathway and going into the road. Uh, this was an issue uh, back, you know, because of the Americans with Disabilities Act before we had all these curbs and people with them wheelchairs, you know, couldn't actually get off the road or get, you know, um, in from the road back to a sidewalk. And so they pro provided down, you know, put in the ramps, but then people with limited disabilities who use a cane, uh, you know, for actually, you know, sounding out the, the, the curb generally uh, for, you know, learning, like, if you're going into the street, they didn't have that available then. So by law now, you know, any time that you have a pedestrian or a shared-use facility like our bike paths, you know, and you're crossing a road, you're supposed to have those detectable warnings at the end. Um, and a another item, you know, related to the pathway ending is that I thought that there, you know, wasn't that, you know, good science for marking, you know, for letting vehicles know that you could be expecting bicyclists traveling in the roadway, as well as let you know uh, bicyclists know that if you're going to be traveling on that roadway, you need to ride with traffic. So there are signs available that you could actually tag that on, like where it says pathway ends, ride with traffic, and so that way people know about that. Um, so this is an example of a uh, detectable warning. You can see the, the red over here. You have high visibility crosswalk markings and you're crossing a roadway. It doesn't have to be that high tip, but uh, this is an, another picture you know, showing how you know, a person that has limited sight uh, can actually, you know, uses a cane and actually can feel those little bumps on the detectable warning to let them know that they're going in the street. And so the other aspect of this is that they have that detectable warning knowing that they're entering the street Typically, you know, they're going to travel on a straight line, and they're going to try and ex you know, expect to see another one of these on the other side of the roadway to let them know that they've actually exited the street. So, you know, where you have a ramp into the street that's, you know, for pedestrian purpose, you have to have a ramp on the other side, and that's something that we did not have on that pathway in that location. So, you know, I know this kind of goes against, um, you know, logical thought because, you know, people would say, wait a minute. The road, you know, um, the road agency that just put in the sidewalk, they put in a ramp, and then they put a ramp going out to the sidewalk and you know, out of the street, but they didn't finish the sidewalk going any farther. Well, you know, by law, they actually have to do that, even if they are not planning on having a sidewalk continue, because legally you, it's a safety <coughs> issue. You have to get that uh, you know, person out of the roadway. So. You know, if we want to have that ramp into the street on Voight, we have to try and figure out some way cre creatively to uh, have a, either a ramp on the other side or close this off to pedestrians so that way we protect ourselves from liability issues. This is another example of an ADA crossing. Um, but this is something that's interesting in the city of Monroe. Um, so this is Dixie Highway. Uh, this is a transition from a bike lane to a sidewalk where you know, bicyclists were traveling on the sidewalk afterwards. And this, here's another example of one in Ann Arbor, but we call this a, a roundabout escape ramp. So typically, you know, you have a, a bike lane in this case, um, and you know, this is the upstream shot, but uh, for bicyclists that don't want to actually go through the roundabout and you know, ride it like they would if they're in a car and be, do vehicular bicycling, they actually can use a ramp to get up onto the sidewalk, go on the outside of a, uh, a roundabout, and then come back in and actually you know, carry on in the bike lane. So um, there is some uh, you know, you know, new experimental treatments that other uh, communities across the nation have been using where the placement of the detectable warning actually uh, will let the, uh, a blind pedestrian know that this is actually not a sidewalk ramp and you shouldn't be expecting to cross the street on the other side, but it's more of a detectable warning that you would see along a, a transit stop or, you know, for example, along Park Lane where you have um, the Horseshoe Driveway, uh, Park Lane School, 
and you know, uh, they have the detectable warnings along the entire uh, side of the sidewalk where it's up about you know, one foot above the actual driveway, and it's just to let you know that you're going to be going off a cliff, not a cliff, really a cliff, curb. but you know, going off the curb. There's a sight distance issue, so it's warning you about um, that uh, potential problem. So there's ways that we could get around uh, uh, the bike ramp issue by doing something like that, and we should investigate that moving forward if you know, we're going to be redoing some of the paths. Oh, and this is just an, another shot showing the, uh, the entrance of, you know, if you're coming from the bike lane and you want to, rather than go through the uh, roundabout, come up onto the sidewalk. So in that, that particular case, they're actually directing you out of the... <clears throat> yeah. Interrupt you, but that's interesting. They, not from, they don't want you to go through the roundabout. Well, the, they're not saying that they don't want you to. What they're saying is that it's safer for you to yeah. be... To, to travel with the cars and go single file through the roundabout. So you might be right behind that minivan. You should be you know, there, and there might be a car behind you. Um, for, typically, you know, that is you know, the, the safest way for a cyclist to be going through the roadway in that type of situation. But if you're not comfortable doing that, that's why they provide this other option that you can actually get up onto the sidewalk. <clears throat> so... Uh, another example at this in the, uh, location was that we do have the bike route sign. So, uh, you know, bike routes are you know the basically it's a designation of a different types of different types of facilities to let them know, uh, users know that there's an advantage to using that specific type of facility. So, a bike route could be a combination of different types of facilities. So, I'll give you an example with the. Iron Bell Trail, which is really you know a you know a bike route or a hiking route, so it can be a combination of shared use pathway like we have over here with our bike paths, but it could be uh, sidewalks, it could be uh, roads that have you know low traffic volumes, so you're comfortable over, you know doing that. It could connect into a uh, rail trail. It could be uh, a collection of um, residential roadways. And so, example, if you're in a, uh, a city where you have uh, a good gridded street network, so basically every quarter mile or so there's a side street, and so you have this you know, nice grid going on, you try and figure out what, from a bicycle standpoint, if you want to get from the north end of the town to the south end of town, which of those you know, maybe 10 different roadways that go north and south do you use? Uh, and you would apply the bike, rate, bike route designation to the roadway that has the advantage for the bicyclists. So maybe one of the roads has less cars traveling down it, or it's more residential, or even you know, more importantly, maybe when you're coming up to some of those mile roads or other roadways that have tra higher traffic volumes and you're trying to cross that road, you know, a certain street might have a light, and so that way you actually have a time to cross the street and not have to worry about uh, getting gaps in traffic. So that's where a bike route actually makes sense. In this case, we have a path system that most people know what it is. So this is a sign that in some cases it might make sense, but in the case of what, how it's applied on our path, especially on Meridian, which is, just goes straight, you know, it's just a redundant sign. So, you know, the question was, is this sign needed? And, and you know, if you're going to put in bike route signs, couldn't you tell, you know, a little bit more quality of information besides saying bike route? Because if you think about seeing that sign, it'd be like the same thing as pulling up to a road and seeing a green sign that says road. It's like, of course it's a road, but what does it actually do? What qualitative information is there? So, you know, what people do with uh, different types of routes is they might label them. Um, so this is an example in, in Portland. They have 18th Street. They actually have you know, a little symbol for a bicycle on the street sign. But they also have wayfinding signage to let you know what are the attractions that you might be coming to. So you know, going back to our sign over here, if we wanted something, which I'm not suggesting that we do, it might make more sense to say this, you know, uh, you know, turn left if you want to go, you know, south to the Macomb Street district, or you know, if you're at the Macomb Street district, you have a you know a sign that says, oh, turn 
uh, left uh, coming off of Macomb to go south to you know, head to the airport. So you know, if there's different destinations, that will be you know, help you decide, you know, is this the road that you want to take or is this the path that you want to take? So I mean, my advice would be either we remove that or we enhance it so that way it actually makes more sense and provides some value. So uh, another thing that we looked at in this location was you know, a lot of signage that doesn't relate specifically to our paths. So we have a lot of regulation signage. Uh, you know, I'm not sure how many people listen to you know, 1700 AM radio, but you know, is that a sign that's really needed as you're entering Grozeal? I don't know. I don't know if that's a legal requirement, but it might be nice to talk to the police chief or the supervisor or our township manager and find out about that. Also, you know, the signs about hunting and trapping and fishing, it's like, I don't know. I mean, is that something that we could get rid of? It's pretty much well known. Or, you know, we put it at an actual location where people could be entering our open space. So that way it's more relevant rather than just being a sign along the road. And, you know, people, for the most part, aren't reading it, but it does look ugly along the roadway. Yeah, could it be... Would it be more effective as you know, as as you cross the the, col the toll bridge, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to on this telephone pole, and who who's and there's so much signage, who's going to read it? If there's some legal reason that you have to have a notification, no hunting on, you know, could it just be have a better placement so that it doesn't, it's not crowding, and you have so much information that nobody can is going to read it anyways. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I think it'd be nice to you know talk to. You know, some of the other folks at the township and find out if we need it or not. And obviously, it's not our charge to say take it down, but we can ask the question. Uh, mm -hmm. There's it, somebody, one example I think of is uh, there are bike lanes up in Detroit and Michigan Avenue up in the Delano Central area. There are bike lanes. What's really confusing. If I was a cyclist riding the, the bike lane, I, I, I knew exactly where I was at. It's the motorists. And can if as I approach as I approach an intersection, do I where do I make my turn from? You know, can I cross into the bike lane and make my turn? There's a lot of confusion there. So I think it goes right along with this, is that it's a mixed message. As a cyclist, I know where I'm at, I know what I'm doing. But it's the it's the uh, the car. Mm -hmm. driver of the car that might be confused as to what I'm going to do as a cyclist. Yeah, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but again, with this sign up here on the, this telephone pole, it's an inappropriate use of the sign because, you know, this isn't actually facing the bike path. You're not riding down the path, and, you know, you don't see that sign and say, oh, okay, well, I'm coming upon a road that is a bike route, and I'm, I got a decision. I can turn left or I can turn right. I, can, I shouldn't go straight because there's no advantage of going that way. The way this sign is set up is that it's for the motorist to let them know, oh, you're crossing the path. But it doesn't say anything about the path. It's you know a green sign, which is more for information purposes, and it's way too small. So you know it doesn't really, you know, it's not, it's an inappropriate sign for what we're actually trying to accomplish. In that it could there be a more case. attractive sign, and let's just say the the little brown sign below the. The, the two arrows, the arrows facing, you know, two different directions yeah. where it says Sacred Heart Church. If it was a more attractive sign that identified the bike path, uh, and if in partnership with perhaps, you know, the, the Presbyterian Church, Sacred Heart Church, St. James Church, uh, if they could share, let's say you design a sign, and they could share into the cost, and their name would be on their Sacred Heart Church this way. Instead of having all this signage, one attractive sign that would catch your eye and make you want to read it. Yeah. As opposed to just another just another sign. I, I see what you're 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 saying there, and the, uh, there are communities that you know are working with uh, local uh, businesses and stuff. The trick is uh, with ro signs that are in the roadway; they are specifically regulated by the state and by the uh, the federal government as well. So there's something called the MUTCD, so Manual for Uniform Traffic Control Devices. And it's put out by the federal government, and they say, you know, these are the signs that you can use, and these are the only places that you can actually use them. And anything that you deviate from that, it's either illegal or you have to have a, you know, a request to experiment with it. I'm thinking like then, our open space signs or identifies yeah. a piece of open so space what property. what I'm saying is like any sign that's actually in the public right-of-way, mm -hmm. you know, Wayne County, 
and you know the federal government they they have a say so in that so that there is a way, there is ways to do it but it's a little bit harder to accomplish but i think it's a good goal um so i forgot where it's going with that oh, oh but you know, oh the other item is that you know with wayfinding signage you you try not to um you know, call out specific businesses or something where it might give an unfair advantage. So rather than, let's just say for the sake of it, you know, we're, uh, we'll pick on McDonald's and, you know, McDonald's wanted, you know, McDonald's is not here, but say that they were and they wanted to, uh, you know, have, you know, a wayfinding sign for that. That, that wouldn't be a good use of public money or, you know, a public private partnership. But if there was, you know, cause maybe there's Burger King there, there, maybe there's a mom and pop shop, maybe it's Island Coney that's right over there. Um, but rather than say that, you'd say, oh, this way to the restaurant district. And that way everything's covered and it's much more inclusive. So th there, there's a lot of minutia, but I, I like where you're going with that, Tom. It just have something more attractive that would make you want, make you want to read the sign as opposed yeah. to there's so much up there, I don't want to read any of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I agree with you. And I think, you know, you know aside from maybe that Sacred Heart, you know, uh, plaque, you know, maybe all the rest of it can come down that we don't want it. Who knows? Um, the next type of sign that we looked at, and, you know, I'm spending a lot of time at this intersection, but this is really applicable along the entire pathway, um, is these no motor vehicle signs. So this is something that, you know, I'm still going to need to, you know, look into a little bit. I don't know if it's a regulated sign that you have to have it. What if we said something like no powered vehicles? Now it doesn't identify electric, gas, no powered. Oh, it's powered. It's, you know, bicycles are human powered. So yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm just. I'm just. I'm just trying. I, to... No, I hear you. But it's like you know, we're, we're trying to figure out a way. You know, can you actually get rid of this sign? Because in some cases, you'd say, well, it's pretty obvious. This is really narrow. It's eight feet. It's you know, uh, motor vehicle lanes are generally ten to twelve feet in width. Um, you're seeing bicyclists on here. Unless you're drunk or something, then you shouldn't. You should know that you can't take your car along this area. Maybe um, golf the, cart. Uh, yeah, um, golf carts go up there, and that's something that we have to talk about. Golf carts on there every once in a while. Um, but you know, so there, there might be other. W Jane, I think you were going to say something. Eliminate that sign and put a post in the middle, just like everywhere else. Yeah. Um, mm. You could do that. And I would say, you know, as a bicycle and pedestrian planner, and you know, it's pretty. The consensus is that we don't want to see the posts there because those are fixed objects. Something at night that you might not see, and you run into it, and you fall off your bike, break your shoulder. Uh, so putting you know, a concrete post or something out there is not that great of an idea. But there is other things that you can do besides have the, you know those bollards out like in the pathway. And I'm going to show you. One of them in, in a minute here. In that case, if that's not a good idea, then we should get rid of the one by the Moody and Elementary and by the Medica. Get rid of them then. Uh, my, my personal opinion, yeah, I'd like to see something else because, you know, it's a, it's a hazard. And, you know, you basically you're not supposed to have fixed objects within, you know, the, the path or two feet on the shoulders uh, because, you know, people could, you know, they, they pull off the side of the road, or they lose, they lose control of their bicycle. You don't want to actually hit something that's going to really injure you. Um, so all these signs, and this is more information you guys need to know, uh, they're breakaway. Uh, so from a motor vehicle standpoint, you, you're not supposed to have fixed objects either. So you hit the sign, it's actually got a, um, generally it's like a bolt or something where the two pieces of U-channel go together, and so that way part of it gets knocked down, and you're not actually um, you know, hitting the sign and going into the, the concrete base. What about that little octagon stop sign since it's an intersection with a light? Oh, in that situation, yeah. <laughs> Th that's a, generally it's a blinking light, so it might be okay, but I, okay. I, I hear what you're, what you're saying. <laughs> um, but that comes Bingo. back to the stop signs. There we go. And, you know, we hear a lot about this on the island. <laughs> um, and, you know, I understand where people are coming from, that, you know, you want to be safe. You want to, you know, teach your kids how to, uh, you know, Watch out for cars, uh, engineers, you know, and you know, uh, other roadway owners. You know, feel like they, it, it's a liability if they don't put that down there. But in a lot of cases, I think it's overkill, and it's something that people aren't going to actually listen to. 
Uh, how many bicyclists do you see that actually don't stop at the stop signs? Um, so uh, there's within the AASHTO document, and this is the American Association for State Transportation and Highway Officials. It's a collection of police, of uh, engineers at the local level, state level, um, you know, federal level, uh, emergency managers, uh, planners, you name it. If there's somebody that's involved with the design of uh, roadway features, they're part of AASHTO. So AASHTO puts out many different documents, some that are great sleeping, you know, uh, sleeping material. Um, other ones are pretty interesting. So this is uh, you know, one that's d dedicated specifically to bicycle facilities. It was put out, the newest ed edition was put out in 2012, but they're in talks of actually redoing it right now. So we should probably see you know, a new version in 2018 or 2019. But it looks at you know, from the planning, it looks at the design of uh, bicycle facilities. And it calls out for shared use paths. And I, you know, I, I um, gave you a handout that actually includes some of this language over here. And it's you know, basically telling you, you, know, you should be a little bit more cautious with the use of stop signs and not to overuse them because you know, while you feel like you're, you're using an attempt to protect the pathway user, in a sense, you're desensitizing that person you know, to that stop sign. So there's plenty of stop signs that, hey, I don't need to stop here. And so, you know, you ignore it. So, but maybe there's a stop sign where you really should be stopping there, and so you, but you ignore it anyways because you think it's like the other signs, and then that person is actually in, you know, some deep trouble. Um, so they say that, you know, you could use yield signs rather than stop signs <clears throat> because that could have the same effect. Um, and there's other things that you can do out there. Um, so some of the questions I'd ask folks is, you know, when you're, designing a sidewalk or you're walking on a sidewalk, how many stop signs do you see for, specifically for pedestrians when you're crossing the road? None. You know, if you're in a bike lane in Detroit or you know, anywhere across you know, the state or uh, the nation, do you see stop signs at every single you know, side street? You don't because you know, uh, you know, you're on the road and it's Specifically for bicycling, you have a unique characteristic that you know, you're in motion, and the more you slow down, the more you stop, the more likely you're going to be able to tip over. So you have a, you know, a very uh, good incentive to actually not stop if you don't need to. And so again, you know, you're working with that to begin with, where if you stop, you might fall over. It's much harder to actually start your bicycle back up. You're dealing with you know, human behavior at that point. So you want to put out stop signs where it's absolutely necessary. You really want that person to stop rather than just doing it as a catch-all, like, well, let's be safe and put a stop sign here. Yes, Bob. We're adjusting the stop signs on the uh, bike path. For one second, let's address the stop signs that are on the bike path for motor vehicles. I don't think there's one street on Gross Hill where there is a bike path crossing where there is a stop sign that there is a white stop block five feet before the stop sign. Mm -hmm. and that's an MDOT requirement. I think if we put addressed it to the motorist, we have the stop sign here, and some of them may not be aware of the bike path. Some of them might be doing something else. But there's that white line across the road five feet before a stop sign that could maybe grab their attention. It's just a thought to get the... Wayne County, what do you think? Um, you yeah, know, it's possible. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, think about our bike paths. Yeah, I, I Take agree. Take a moment and look around. Yeah, if you have a stop sign, there probably should be a stop bar. Stop you know, bar. If there's not a stop sign there, then, yeah, you probably don't want that stop bar. If anything, Maybe you want a yield bar or something. If sort, anything, but. especially where there's a bike path crossing that street. Mm-hmm. I, I think we really need to, you know, work with the township and then, you know, work with Wayne County to, you know, try and come up with some designs for where we do have the, these path crossings that meet the needs. Especially I know, I mean, you know, pavement markings, there's maintenance issues with that. And yeah. as we discussed before, uh, we have limited budgets. So, you know, if it's something that Wayne County is going to have to pay for, they're probably not going to be too happy about doing that. If it's something that we can do with our bike path maintenance funds, well, maybe they'll be open to that. But they still they feel 
Um, you know, I think the, the context is everything, and in some situations they might be more willing to do it, in other cases they won't. Brian, do you know if I may ask, uh, we were talking about Wayne County here, and this is, this would also be under MDOT, but also federal too, wouldn't it? Just, well, you know, for fundings or grants possibly? Yeah, so, um, you know, the, the different designs, you know, there's basically, you know, Wayne County is the one that owns the roadway. But they receive funds from the state and receive funds from the federal government. So with that comes strings. So you have to adhere to certain design standards. So one of the things that you'll hear about, and this is a little bit of a tangent about you know, West River, is like, well, we can't repair that roadway because it doesn't meet the actual roadway widths that we need to via AASHTO. So you have to, supposed standard, to have you know, 12 the you know, the Ashto would say, "Oh, you need 10 to 12 feet." And a lot of times, you know, road agencies say, "Well, let's take the maximum. Let's be safer." Even though there's no, uh, well, <coughs> anyways, never mind. Um, Thank you, Brian. But yeah, so uh, th there's different design standards out there. But um, so in some cases, a stop sign is going to r really be make sense. So this is here at a mid-block crossing north of Horse Mill. You know, not an intersection. From far away, bicyclists and uh, motorists aren't going to be able to really see the bicyclists. They don't. They're not expecting it, especially if they're not familiar with Grozeal. So and this is a case where, yes, let's have that stop sign there. You're entering traffic. Traffic might not be expecting you. But on other situations, maybe that stop sign isn't needed. But you could do something like this. So this is part of the Iron Bell Trail, part of the um, Downriver Link Greenways. It's uh, a connection along the I-275 Metro Trail at Sibley Road. So we're out by I-275. It's you know, a shared use path along the freeway. They just recently put this in over the last couple of years. And, you know, you do see the stop sign there because, you know, you are crossing Sibley Road. It's mid-block. I understand that there. So I'm not saying that, you know, you have to have the stop sign. But in this case, it makes sense. But what I want you to you know, pay attention to is, first of all, this little median within the pathway. It breaks up you know, the roadway. And it breaks up the pathway and it kind of lets you know that you're go you know, coming into a roadway. But also, for the motorists... You know, this pathway is much more narrow now. So even if you are, you know, if you had a few beers, you could say, hey, that, that's five foot, you know, uh, sidewalk over here. I'm not supposed to be riding on sidewalks. So they can, it's a little bit more intuitive to say that, you know, they shouldn't be traveling on this pathway. It's not a road. Additionally, from a bicycling standpoint, you know, we see pavement markings saying, you know, stop ahead. You know, but this could be any language. It could be, you know, yield to cross, you know, to uh, the road, or we could put just the road name along the pathway. So it could just say, you know, Horse Mill Road or Macomb, or. Um, but it, it's another indication that you are coming across, you know, a, a crossing where you're going to have to pay attention and look for traffic. Additionally, you see the um, the, the median line over here. Another visual cue that you're coming into, you know, an intersection. So, you know, it's a little bit longer ahead that you see that first, and then you see the stop ahead sign. Um, this is the ADA ramp that I was telling you about before. You know, they do still have this motor vehicle sign here. So, again, it's something, I'm not sure if we can get rid of it, but if we can, it'd be great. Um, but as Bob was saying, you know, earlier about, uh, you know, pavement markings across roadways and the crosswalk. This is the standard style crosswalk that you see you know, across America. You know, two traverse lines. You know, you, we're maybe you know, 10 or 20 feet away from it, and it's still barely visible to the naked eye. These are different forms of high visibility crosswalk markings that you actually you know, in, you know, increase the surface area of the, uh, the pavement marking and you know, make it more longitudinal going with the, uh, the roadway and the, the driver's eye picks it up much more. So, you know, maybe we don't get the stop bars on some of these side streets, but maybe we do get a high visibility crosswalk marking. So they, they kind of know that, hey, maybe I shouldn't be blocking this crosswalk because, you know, bicyclists or pedestrians might be coming through here. We could, as a township, on the bike path itself, I, you know, like the, the yellow line, you know, going back a slide, the yellow line that was uh, led up to the intersection. Yeah, that identified that as a as a as a, a bicyclist. You know, if I saw that, uh, that would certainly catch my eye and indicate that there is that right there exactly yeah. uh, that I'm coming to an intersection. I like that, and I think that's something 
uh, in our maintenance fund that, that we could probably do. Those, the other uh, the crossbars that are on the road themselves, that's, that's Wayne County. But yeah. I, can, I can think of a couple spots, uh, I want to say the, the ferry road crossing especially, uh, where, where bars like that would inform the, uh, you know, the oncoming car traffic that there is a, a crossing there, a pedestrian crossing there, and make them aware. Because as you go through those S curves, you know, t people have a tendency to just maybe speed up a little bit, but yeah. it, it's blind. You don't see, mm -hmm. you don't see a, a, that intersection until you get right on top of it. Uh, if we're doing triage and saying we've only got limited funds or Wayne County's only going to let us do it at select locations, the two that I would say is the one that you're mentioning with Ferry Road, uh, but one even more important than Ferry Road because you know, Ferry Road has the light, which is at least something. Yes. Uh, is the, you know, the mid-block crossing north of Horse Mill. So, again, you, you mm -hmm. yes. So I, I showed you that one before. Um, you know, you, it's really dark out there. There's no lights. Uh, and then if you're traveling northbound, you already went through the intersection. You thought you crossed the path, but then, you know, shortly after you go through that intersection, there's another, you know, crossing. Correct. So, you know, that's like where I think it's really, really important. But you know, this uh, leading up to an intersection on our bike path, <coughs> uh, 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 one, one spot I think of is that that offset crossing at the uh, public safety building. Yeah. If you're not paying attention, you could very easily just shoot across the driveway and all of a sudden there's a curb there. And yeah. it, they, whether it's daylight or, you know, or dark, uh, that's, that's a little, uh, you got to be ready for it. Let's put it that way. And I know some of my fellow commissioners have talked about, you know, a center line running down the path before. And personally, I, I haven't been in favor of a continuous running you know, center no. line because that seems very urban to me. And, you know, it makes it treat it more like a roadway. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, again, you know, the ju judicious use of you know, our limited funds and say, well, you know, I, I'm not, maybe it would be good, but, you know, it's yeah, not no, my I highest list. Not the, but not the but full using length, it at but select locations, yes. like going up to an intersection or where there might be a turn in the road rather than having that sign up there that, you know, everybody sees and say, well, that's a, that's not that big of a turn. Why the heck do we have a, a sign up there you know, polluting our uh, aesthetic views? Um, you know, maybe you can just have you know the stripe down there that actually shows that the uh, the pathway is turning. I think that and, would be. And you know, if you do this with the right tape, it's got retro reflectivity to it, and so even at night, your light's going to bounce off that, and you're going to be able to see it. Mm -hmm. I think that would do a, a world of uh, a good for a pathway. Yeah, we're certainly not going to do it for every residential driveway. No, but uh, there are certain spots that could be identified where this would would be a, a, a you know a big help. Uh, especially to people that are riding the path at night. It's all of a sudden here's an indicator. Lowry and Meridian, Ferry, all those. They can all use something like that. And a continuous line down the middle, people don't like that. Be like the zoo. Templates of elephant feet every six <laughs> feet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you know, trying to balance between you know having that I mean the nice rural aesthetic that you know mm -hmm. people come out here for, but you know, make it safe and you know Make things, you know. Yeah, I don't want to be like, old. Enjoy the signage. Path. It's just, it just is attractive. I'm just glad we're addressing this because we've talked about this. So another thing that High you visibility. Can, another thing you can put in the roadway is you see these yellow signs across the. So this is again in Ann Arbor. Uh, they have systematically, you know, gone through you know, a lot of their areas where they have, you know, crossings of roadways. They've put in this R16 sign. So uh, Western Michigan University, they have a big transportation department. Uh, they do some academic studies, and they've studied these in Michigan. They've studied them in uh, Florida and a lot of places. And the use of these signs are uh, effective gateway treatment, or essentially, you know, if a motor vehicle is coming up to this intersection, it serves the function of traffic calming that the, the motorist actually slows down. Because if you have those signs out in the road, while you have plenty of room, you know, visually, it looks like it's you know, a condensing of the roadway, a narrowing of the roadway, and so you you, you just instinctively you know, start to slow down, and so you start to slow down, and you see the pedestrians or the you know, kids in this case are coming out from school, they're coming across the roadway. Um, you're start you're slower to begin with, so you have a you know a quicker stopping distance, and so it's safe, it's effective, and it's cheap. 
So you know, that's something we could think about if we do have some compliance issues. I'm not suggesting that we need, I definitely not suggesting that you do this everywhere. I'm not suggesting we do it at all. I just wanted to show that it's another tool that you can put out there. Makes a great snowplow target. Yeah, <laughs> well, you, you do it, there's maintenance with them. You, know, you do have yes, to uh, yeah. you know, take care of them. And be, they, they do get hit, but I'd rather uh, have you know, a sign get hit than a kid. I've been, and again, because of my driving around up in Detroit on Livernoy coming up to, uh, uh, I guess that would be Dick's at that point. Yeah. Uh, some, of, some of the posts that, that they have installed, uh, some of it's got to do with, with, with bike pass. You know, there are, there are lines on the road, but some of the posts that they put on really tend to you know, slow traffic down. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, Livernoy and Dick's, I'm trying to remember that. Yeah. I know uh, uh, Livernoy, you know, um, near Michigan Avenue and going by 94, they've put the, the posts in for yeah, protective that, they're bike Yeah, they're in that area as well. So, um, But, yeah, I, there, there's a lot of new treatments out there. <coughs> and so that's why it's certain that that book that I mentioned to you, the, the Ashtell Bike Guide, the 2012 one, believe it or not, some of those, you know, it seems like there are some kind of radical designs in those there. Those are conservative designs now. That is the lowest common denominator throughout the, the nation. And so there's other organizations like NACTO, National Association for City Transportation Officials, and um, you know, other organizations that are much more urban areas that they're pushing the envelope and testing the new uh, different facilities out there. And so that's where we get the protected bike lanes that we're seeing in Detroit and Ann Arbor and Lansing. And it's where we're you know, getting into lots of different you know, types of treatments that are going to make it into AASHTO. So that's why AASHTO is now saying that they need to uh, redo the, uh, their, their guide. And so you know, this information will be included in there moving forward. Um, so this is, you know, again, Horse Mill Road. Uh, we're on Meridian. We're north of Horse Mill. So this is the mid-block crossing. I just wanted to show, for one, you cannot see that, uh, those traverse lines at all. But what you can see is this nice you know, sign saying that you know, you're coming across, be expecting bicyclists. This is an advanced warning sign. It's really helpful. And then you know, closer up, you actually have the sign that has the arrow pointing down for the crosswalk. This sign that you're showing here, and there's an, they're everywhere, there's also on horse mill. My question, and I'm glad, glad you showed this, is there is this the Wayne County or the state deems how far back the sign has to be? Because I've often thought that these signs are too far back from the crossover. Because if you look to see where it is way up there, and we know where that is, that's quite a distance. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Is well, that something? I, I think John can add a little bit more to it. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll just say that there are design standards, yeah. and so based on traffic speed. Mm -hmm. That you know you're you're supposed to put them back so far, so there's an equation for it. Yeah, those are, maybe you those want are to based on speed. You know, okay. you're, you're still traveling at 40 feet per second. You know, probably at that type of the design speed through there. So okay. you've got a reaction time of two and a half seconds or something like that. You know, that's so this sign, if it was just by <laughs> itself, I'd agree with you that yeah, this is too mm -hmm. far back because the crosswalk is all the way over here. But this sign's purpose isn't to say that there's a crosswalk coming up, you know, like right away. It doesn't indicate crossing. It's both, yeah, it doesn't indicate the crossing. So what it's doing is it's getting your attention. It's like, oh, there's bicyclists in this area? You know, that maybe there's going to be a crosswalk. And then so that you're a little bit more prepared for when you do see that sign. Well, that's, that's a nice sign. You're right. But just below that sign, <clears throat> and I'm getting onto a subject of putting a sign just below there as wide as the legs are and about a foot wide. You got the bicycle and then have the word crossing. Um, yeah, uh, there's different stuff out there. So sometimes you see. Bicycle crossing. You don't even have to say ahead. If yep. people don't get crossing, is ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some yeah. of those things that we're doing, like uh, actually MDOT's doing a crossing at, uh, at Woodhaven uh, over I 75. They're building a, a multi use bridge through there that's going to connect basically the east and west side of West Road. And they, they on the off ramps they have ped crossing coming on that that will be in addition to the advanced okay. signage yeah. right in the, right in the <clears throat> off ramp it's going to say P E D crossing yeah oh, ped. 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 ped like pedestrian pedestrian just short for pedestrian I yeah said ped. oh no head <laughs> crossing no. 
Yeah, so I mean, obviously there's ways to enhance it, but mm -hmm. I, I just want to show, to me, this is a much more effective sign that lets you know about the crossing because we saw those bike route signs that were being used for this purpose here. Uh, so that's why I'm saying that it was an inappropriate sign for the, you know, for the use that they're trying to do. Uh, and we're going to see, you know, a picture in a little bit where they actually include both signs. So again, you know, let's try and figure out what we're trying to make both the, you know, all the roadway users do, like change their behavior from a you know, driver standpoint, from bicycle standpoint, pedestrian standpoint, and then apply the, the most appropriate sign rather than just putting all the signs out there to, to cover our bases. Um, so again, this is, you know, you're traveling on Bridge Road. Uh, this is, you know, crossing Meridian. This sign over here is for the motorists because, you know, it's on this uh, street sign over here saying this is a bike route. And the bicyclist, they're going to know this is a path. This is pretty much the same thing as that yellow sign. It's just in the wrong spot, wrong type of sign. I'd say get rid of it. This is a location, again, this is right at Horse Mill Road where we have the the bicycle sign with the arrow pointing down to point actually at the crosswalk, but again facing the, you know, the driver, so it's not for the motor for the bicyclist. It's saying, "Oh, there's a bike route here." It's like, well, I, I get that. But yeah, there's a bike route here because hey, there's this path. You got this big sign here. You don't need this other little sign. Um, as I mentioned before, you know some of these little uh, you know curve signs. Well, if we put you know a stripe in in this location, maybe just right over here on the road, maybe we you know, we can get, actually get rid of that and not have to have that. So, in summary, from our sections, I think you know most of us you know, agreed that we need to do you know better for you know ADA Americans with Disabilities Act, especially with those uh, um, detectable warnings. You know, it's the law. We want to protect ourselves moving forward. Don't have to do it right away. Don't have to rip stuff up, but. As we're actually, you know, maybe redoing an intersection, that would be the time that we should, you know, probably do these upgrades. Uh, additionally, you know, we should remove the bike route signs unless we come to, uh, we decide that we want to build a wayfinding system, you know, make it systematic and figure out all the destinations and, you know, they provide some value because otherwise, you know, they're just, it's sign clutter. Uh, next, you know, you remove unneeded stop signs and replace either, you know, with a yield or you know, those boulevards like I was talking about, or you know, pathway markings, we could do stripes, we could do the text along the road. Uh, you know, again, there's a lot of different things that we can use besides a stop sign at some of these more secondary roads that don't get much traffic. Uh, and then you know, explore the, the need, you know, can we actually remove some of those no motorized vehicle signs? Again, don't know. Um, so uh, remove the curve signs where possible. And then you know, explore you know, with, uh, with the road agencies about high visibility crosswalk markings, potentially sharrows or bike lanes where some of these uh, pathways are ending. This is something that we might want to take, break it up to a small group, like three or four of us, with a specific goal in mind as far as signage, not the condition of the bike path, but just signage itself, and go intersection, intersection uh, as a small group, come back with recommendations and to see where we can take it from there. Yeah, uh, that, that's what I was hoping to do with the, uh, when we did our uh, study session last time, obviously it took much longer and you know, some of us were having fun, you know, talking about all these different signs and other people I think were, you know, a little bored and like, come on, man, let's ride. So it, it didn't work out exactly to get the whole thing done, but I, I really feel like we had some good conversations on that to like build a base so that way we're all playing with the same information so yes. that way we can apply that. But what I would like to do, and this is ambitious, but it would be nice to you know, have an inventory of every single sign along the pathway, a picture of it or something, and then you know, have a recommendation for what to do with it. Or do we remove it? Do we enhance it? That's right, uh, but let's just focus, focus on signs. Yeah. And then, you notice this presentation didn't talk about pavement at all. Yeah, so I just, I'll let Bob yeah. or some or uh, John here talk about that I'll next be, time. <laughs> I'll be I'll be happy to be part of that. So if okay. uh, if we want to make it happen, let's make uh, a motion to appoint or ask for volunteers to get with Tom and do this. So uh, make a motion to see this happen. And how many do we want to get involved with this? What do you think, uh, Brian and Tom? Three people. It'd be good. Um, I'd be interested. John, John are you yeah. interested in doing it? Yeah. 
I, and I, I think Alan would be good too because of his experience okay. in law enforcement. A little, it's just my. So we, we, you know, we, whether it's cell phones or can't you just bring yeah. a camera or something like that, and we'll we'll just inventory. We'll go intersection to intersection or wherever there's you know currently signs, mm -hmm. and uh, take pictures from four different directions. You know, uh, and then uh, we can make a rec recommendation based on what we're seeing. Great, I, I support that. So we got you made the motion. I support. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And the, the we just need as a you know what what day, what evening, uh, be it a weekend, be it you know if we do it you know it takes us three evenings to do it during a week. Uh, Make her, you know, yeah. we'll get it happen, you know, make it happen. Great. Thank you, everyone. I would I would also like to talk, maybe ask Dale about the ADA warnings, because those, the funding source for that could be um, CDBG block grants, that they will fund all uh, ADA improvements. And uh, so we could, just have to put that in the program year and if we identify that you know we get a certain amount of block grant funding i don't know what it is but i think rosiel has a hard time finding places to spend their block grant funding because we just don't have some of the low to moderate areas that other communities have through there it might be worthwhile talking to dale to see if that's i don't know tom do you hear i, I can talk to dale and you know sometimes we in in a uh, uh we feel, you know, in, in, a, in a, I want to say, in a rush to to get do something, a, you know, in regards to ADA, we perhaps we do things that, you know, even though we've, we've installed it, is not used. Uh, so identifying, you know, like if there's grant money and how, you know, something like this, these crosswalks, uh, where it would benefit, you know, a, a large number of people and and fulfill a need that is obviously, you know, belongs there, but. Um, yeah, we'll let's talk to Dale about it and uh, see what we can do. And then who who would have to who would write a grant like that? Well, it would, the, the way the block grant work comes is that we get funding every year for it. Okay. And, um, you just have to program it into the program year, and uh, we probably have one more year before Mr. President Trump takes it all away. But uh, <laughs> you know, so all we'd have to do is do ADA improvements and identify that. Then the township engineer could go in there and. So it's not something that we have to go to and apply for. A, nope. If the money is there, it just you identify what your program needs are, mm -hmm. and you can. And it doesn't have to be very specific in your program application. It's just ADA improvements and put a dollar value to it, and okay, you can great. change that and things like that. And then I think that the committee could come up with recommendations on where where we think that. And so we would pretty much have have conversation with Reigns. That's right, with Sohio, and say, I you, see. you know, and I, it, what could be part of those improvements actually is putting concrete in so you get that uh, contrast of pavement types, which will also identify the difference from asphalt to concrete, mm -hmm. if we so elected to do that, mm -hmm. to, to make the, like the, the cyclists aware that they're coming up to and maybe it's just a major roadways, you know, like the one at church is kind of in rough shape, mm -hmm. you know. Well, I'm going to I'm going to ask with your expertise, would you would you sit down with me and with myself and Dale and. and oh, certainly. It? Yeah. Yep. So we, that way, you know, you'll make it much clearer than I will. Yeah. We but, used to uh, run that for the Wayne County. So that's how I'm familiar with yeah, that. So that'd be great. Yeah. We'll, so. we'll set up a date that we can, uh, you know, be it morning, be it afternoon. Oh, whatever yeah. It is, perfect. And uh, we'll meet with Dale. Perfect time. Yeah, well, we'll get together then. Good job. Yep. Great. Thank you both. Okay. Uh, next item on the agenda is pathway hazards, and uh, this is what Jane was talking about, where she's worried about you know obstructions in the pathway and you know uh, potentially hurting people. So I'm not sure how much more you want. Okay. Uh, a friend of mine from Dearborn, who's very involved with the um, biking program in Dearborn. A friend of hers put something in faith, but that made me think about what we have here. The concrete post at the middle school, at nighttime you can't really see it. We mm -hmm. either remove it or paint it in a bright color. So we need to do that soon. So can I talk, can I test it to John come and have him paint it? The three posts by the soccer field, by the middle school, by the administration building, the post 
So it's gray. Those are part of the safe routes to school. Those were actually required by uh, MDOT mm -hmm. because that was an MDOT funded. But you can't see it though. It's dark at night. Oh, yeah, no, that's true. So uh, what about some retro reflectivity tape? I, I think that would be better than paint is the reflectivity tape. Something, something. Can we ask can I ask John to do it? I'll bring. I have some really great reflective tape, courtesy of Ford Motor Company. <laughs> That's all. That I need. will. Uh, that they should be able to wrap around the post, and it's it's very bright, very reflective. It's uh, required on their uh, motorized equipment. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. I have some. I'll, I'll bring some over. I'll bring some in. We'll, how many posts are there? There's three, I think. I think there's mm -hmm. two and two. Okay. I well, look. Well, get enough for four in case. I'll take. No, the yeah. um, the middle school has some as well. Uh, so we, there's a pathway between the middle school and high school, and at least at the entrance by the the parking lot at the middle school, there's I think even just some fence posts <coughs> that are serving as bollards over in that yeah. spot. Yeah, yeah, there is. Um, so I guess we just identify where those are and let Tom know, and if he's got the the tape and is you know, willing to. Donate it. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Very bright. It's yeah. uh, and, if, and very expensive. And those are. <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah. I'm not kidding. It's very expensive. Oh yeah. Thank you, sir. We greatly appreciate it. Um, next item, and hopefully, I can run through some of these pretty quick. Um, this is just more FYI for everybody that uh, it, uh, Tom and I did ask uh, Ann for uh, finding out what our balance is. Um, so you know. As of now, it, uh, of March 31st, uh, 2017, it was $132,540. So, if you want an itemized statement to be really broken down, uh, I, Anne can provide that for us. This gives you a brief accounting, but if you want a really detailed, I, she can print that out for us as well. It's just all you have to do is ask her. So, yeah, and in the future, it'd be great to, to see that. But the um, full detail. Yeah, every once in a while. It's good to sure. know that. but. Uh, for right now, this is good, and I'd appreciate you. Know, I'm going to try and get in the habit of just asking her every month, so that way we we have a, a breakdown of what's going on. But um, as you can see, from, you know, from last year, we've actually you know almost you know doubled the amount of money <clears throat> that we have. So that's because of the uh, the millage that our you know, residents so graciously uh, you know voted for. So we're starting to build up a surplus that we can do some of these maintenance activities. Um, if there's no questions about that. We'll move on. Yeah. Two columns. The left column is this year, and the right column, the next, okay, 61,000 compared to 132,000. Yeah. Um, is it this year or last year? I do not know since there's no uh, column heading on there, but I know that, you know, Anne did tell me it was 132,000, so that's why I know that we're, we're looking at the this column year. on the left side. So it's packed, but that's how much money we get annually. But on the left side, that's the balance of how we have so far. If we don't spend it, can we carry it forward? Uh, yes, we should be able to carry it forward, okay. as far as I understand. Okay. That's our that's that's our money. Okay. Okay. Uh, next item on the agenda, and I apologize, I've got so much here, and we're running late. I'll try to get it done quickly here. Um, and there's been some conversations uh, with Lorinda and DPS about uh, the purchase of a lawnmower. Uh, you know, Tom and I and uh, uh, a few others of us, you know, talked about this quickly at our uh, study session that we had on the path last month. But being that it was a study session, there was nothing that we could do as far as taking a vote because it's not a public meeting. No one knew about it, could be a participate in it. So, uh, you know, we basically said at that time, it's like we can't take any action at that time and we have to wait for our next meeting. So, um, you know, I'll turn it over to Tom and you know, talk a little bit about it. But uh, basically, the, they're looking to purchase a new mower, and we're wondering if BPAC was interested in, you know, contributing any funds for it. Right. Lorinda approached me about it, and um, I'll just use a round figure because I don't have the exact number in front of me. But it was about $8,000 for an additional lawnmower. Um, it would be used by the DPS by bike path and also recreation uh the time that she asked me was just prior to the island fest and i there wasn't enough time to, for us to react to it and i think she was looking for just an additional more to cover the response some of the responsibilities uh as far as cutting of the fields uh in regards to island fest it has not come she has not brought it back up to me 
So uh, I can't approach her if you want me to. Otherwise, we'll just wait for her. But uh, it would have, it would have primarily have been uh, split between DPS and, and Bike Path. And the, the REC has no money at this time, and uh, they'd have very little uh, investment in it. So if you want me to pursue it, I will. Otherwise, uh, we'll just wait for Lorinda to come back to us. And just a, you know, a little bit more further background is that, you know, we have you know, purchased a new mower in the past because you know, when DPS requested it and, you know, we had uh, put money in towards fixing up the, uh, the the previous mower that was done. And it was a backup mower. I know. That, so it basically seems like every couple of years or so that they're asking either for um, refurbishment of uh, a mower or for a new one, and I'm not saying that to be negative at all. It's just more for just information purposes. Yeah, we spent we spent we we paid DPS approximately five thousand dollars last year uh, for the labor for the you know for the operator to uh, to cut the grass along the bike paths. I'd be more concerned about how many hours, as far as acreage. I'd be concerned more about how many hours uh, we paid for. You know. What the, what the how many hours of five thousand uh, dollars accounted for? So um, I'd like you know I can ask for a breakdown on that. How many man hours were actually put into it? But you know sometimes you wonder that uh, you know we bought we being bike B pack bought the bought the the, uh, the lawnmower, but it's being I think it's being used for purposes other than just cutting along the bike path. So and you know I want to be. And I know that you know my fellow commissioners feel the same way. You know, we want to be good stewards of our money, but we also want to you know play nice with all the other uh, you know, township departments. We're all serving the residents, and so um, if money's coming from our fund versus you know, DPS, I don't like to get into tit for tat and no. you know, owing the exact same amount because you know DPS has done us favors over the years. For example. Uh, our horse mill path, you know, the, the costs for that were more than uh, what we had available for uh, capital improvements, you know, but there was a lot of issues that had to deal with drainage and the DPS had drainage funds available and, you know, they made the motion to use some of those, their drainage funds in order to help us build that pathway. So it's, you know, it's about building relationships between committees and uh, commissions. And so, you know, I don't want to burn any bridges. And um, so, you know, yeah, I don't need you know a complete breakdown, you know, penny by penny, but you know, one, you know, I think it's a good idea, you know, to you know potentially you know, to at least consider, you know, putting some money towards the uh, the mower because you know if it's needed, it's needed. Um, but at the same time, I feel like it'd be good to have a little bit more information, like Tom was saying about how many hours that we have been paying for or how many acres is. You know, BPAC responsible for versus the recreation department versus uh, DPS in general, just so that we kind of have an idea about that, as well as, you know, what should we be expecting as far as recurring costs for new mowers, for new blades, or for repairs? And just so that way it just doesn't come out of the blue like, hey, we need money for this. And it's like, I know that Lorinda is very systematic and, you know, she has her reasons for asking for stuff. It's just conveying that information to us so that way we're in the know when making our decisions. So based on that, you know, all I'm asking for tonight is to get your opinions on, you know, do you agree with me that, you know, it's something that we should could be consider and, you know, have Tom talk to Lorinda more about it to find out the more details and let her know that, yes, we are, you know, potentially interested in going in on a, a mower if it's needed? Or is it something like Tom was saying that we should just wait for her to come back to us? I have a question. I might have asked it before. I don't remember. Bike path on people's private property, do they mow around the path? Uh, that's the a good easement? question. I don't think Who they do. what? I don't think they mow it, but I could be wrong. Do you know anything about that? I thing? don't have enough detail. I, I don't know. But, I'll, you know, I can ha that'll be part of the discussion with Lorinda. Mm -hmm. Um so we have a better understanding. And, you know, yeah, we all have to work together as different, you know, departments, different commissions. Um, but I think we need just a bit more before we uh, commit. And it's, I don't know how important it is this year, but certainly uh, in, the, in the future here it would be something to consider. 
Is there anybody that disagrees with what we're seeing over here? Somehow I think the urgency was was more coming into the island fest, but. Mm -hmm. I want to keep a good relationship with all the committees and commissions. A portion of it, like um, Manchester, Meridian, there's a, a pass of land. Nobody owns it, so I understand. But if it's in front of people's houses, what's another People cut it in front feet. of their houses. There's actually an ordinance that requires that you maintain all the property mm -hmm. in the road right of way in front of your home, unless it's a, a case where a person's not cutting the grass at all, and then the ordinance officer, I would imagine, gets involved. But there's a lot of open space if you look at that pathway through mm -hmm. there. Yeah. That, I don't have a problem. Open yeah. space there, no problem. Yeah. But private property, just a few more feet. So, you know, if, to mow. so if she can tell us, you know, the, the areas that they're mowing, you know, if, if there's, you know, a rough map that she circles on or just all, all the open space, just identify the areas, rough acreage and the amount of hours that we do it versus others, and that way we can see if, are we doing something, you know, somewhat proportionate to, you know, our share or, you know, how it goes, but I think that we're all in favor of finding out a little bit more information and potentially putting money in. Great, thank you, everyone. Um, next item, it's uh, something that I'll just share with you quickly. You have it in front of you, but um, uh, Wes Pfeiffer, uh, he is our bridge inspector, and he's done a, a lot of the work on our uh, pathway bridges over the years. And you know, he asked if we had interest in any uh, bridge work this year. And so some of us were, kind of felt like there wasn't a need for it. Uh, myself and other folks uh, also thought that, well, there, we can only see parts of the bridge. We can't see underneath. So if it's free for him to actually inspect it, might as well have him inspect it and let us know, you know what we're getting into. So uh, the uh, email you, you'll see over here, um, it's, you know, it did come from Tom, who you know, was a, you know, a conduit for uh, Wes. Um, but you know, Wes did let us know that you know, two of our bridges are in pretty decent order. Uh, he was recommending that potentially we reseal them after the summer to protect over the winter. Um, but the, the Meridian Bridge, which is you know, the one right by uh, uh, Meridian School, he said that that one is a, a problem. Uh, that basically the uh, the joists need to be replaced, and it's so it's, it's more structural. He said that it's not something that's completely urgent that we have to do this year, but it's something that we should start probably saving up for. We might be able to get you know you know a couple more years out of it, but I wanted to let everyone know about it, and um, that way we can decide in the future on what to do with that bridge. But there's going to if we value that bridge, there's going to be some, some significant cost to actually you know, keeping it in good order. Uh, any further questions on that? Okay, um, the fair bridge, it's wood that is touching the water, right? Uh, the thoroughfare one, I, I don't know like if it's wood in the water, but yeah, I believe the, some of the um, supports are wood, but thoroughfare bridge seems to be okay. The, the issue is that the underside of the decking on the Meridian Bridge is really close to the soil, and so when the area floods, you know that water is uh, that the decking is sitting underwater. It's in a shaded area, and in the words of Wes Pfeiffer, I know he said in the past that you know it was getting punky. Uh, I, I can't give you an exact definition for that, but um, basically, you know the the wood is starting to rot, so. Um, you know, he, he did mention to that us a while ago, and, you know, we were it's just like now, you know, we're thinking we wanted to stretch it out a little bit farther. So um, with the, the other two bridges, I think, you know, personally, I think that we should probably do them, do the restaining at the end of the year because it's preventative maintenance. It helps stop the wood from potentially getting, you know, it creates a barrier between the water and the wood, and so it helps it from rotting. But the other bridge, you know, there's some significant costs that need to go into that, and the damage is already done, so it might as well just start saving up for, um, you know, replacing the deck itself or, it's, you know, anything else that's been rotting. It's too labor-intensive to try to save any of the, the surface decking. Uh, it, it'd take them hours just to re start removing, you know, single boards. He said the best way to do it is to cut it out, take the, take the running joists out, replace them, 
put them in new, put new decking in there, and now you've got another 10 or 15 years out of it. But uh, it's not an emergency today. He can probably run some longer screws uh, through the cross planks down into the, to get into more solid uh, wood below it, but it is getting soft. Um, and that's why some of the boards are starting to uh, uh, pop up. And he suggests not even bother to reseal it if, if in fact, we're going to do this, in, you know, let's say, next year. It doesn't pay to reseal it this year. And I believe the cost is $50,000 that's, that. he, he, that's an estimate. He, yeah. It'd take about three and a half to four weeks, and he'd want to do it during a, a relatively dry period. Um, otherwise, it's, it's pretty wet in there. But uh, I would think... You know, we 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 talked about perhaps you know like October, November, even into December, where there's not as much use on it. Uh, he could get in there and take you know and do that without being interrupting anybody. Let's put it that way. So just if we you know we can get West to give us hard numbers and just just plan for it. You know maybe maybe uh, uh, you know the fall of two eighteen two thousand eighteen and we you know, plan for it that way. Mm -hmm. And he said it doesn't it doesn't doesn't make any sense to do it in stages like do a third a third a third you just get in there and get it done and while it is a significant cost it's not like it's going to blow the budget either especially if we wait another you know year to actually get it done but i'm really glad that we had the inspection so that way we know what we're doing and there's no surprises um so i guess you know we can do an action at a later date and you know maybe have a study sessions to talk about this and the you know in the bigger scope of things with all of our maintenance activities but i wanted everyone to know about that so that way it didn't sound like we're i'm tom and i are doing stuff on our own where we we learned about stuff we bring it to the commission so that way everyone knows i had just it. bumped into west in the hallway of township you know built you know township hall here and we just started a conversation it wasn't anything that was pre-planned it just conversation came up and went over it so um and i'm sure west would i would think west would come to one of our meetings if we invited him in and uh, we could make a motion to have him go ahead and give us a quote for the whole for the job and then schedule and plan it uh, accordingly there's not any other questions move on i am going to you know ask that you know we can you know, table the uh, future pass facilities and the pack update. You know, Alan's not here, so we can't give a pack update. And future pass could be a long conversation. I think we can you know, talk about that at our next meeting. If that's okay. So I make the motion. Do we have support? Support. John, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, everyone. Um. Next item would be upcoming events. Jane, is there anything that you'd like to let us or the uh, viewers at home know about? This Saturday, 7 in the morning, Lady Vine, Macomb Meridian. Be there or stay on Bob. <laughs> <coughs> and where does that start from? Meridian and Macomb. Thanks. Up to 10 miles, maybe 7, 8 miles an hour. Now, Trenton Festival, what's the update about that? So, um, you know, I, we, we talked about being interested in that, but um, you know, that's going to take a lot of man hours. I don't know if anyone actually does want to sit at a, another booth. Um, it's, it's good, but I think we, I, I don't know how you feel. I, I really don't feel like sitting at another booth again, especially outside of our own community. I'm motion maybe postpone next year or something. Further okay. study. Okay. Postpone. Approved. Fine. <laughs> okay. Walk the path, but do I mean, that's your job. Sorry. <laughs> uh, my question would be, what do we want to do? What do we want to do for walk the walk the uh, walk the path? Uh, Barry's will provide entertainment for us, and uh, you know, so just what do we want to do? So I mean, typically what we've done is you know we've just yeah. Cooked hot dogs. Yeah, I'll bring, drinks, the, I'll bring the bring the Weber grill. And um, what, since there's the uh, Island Wide garage sale as well as the Bear, Wayne State Bear Door happening on the same day, people just happen to come by the uh, um, 
buy them at Comb Commons, and you know, people are there. They, they enjoy some lemonade, enjoy a hot dog. It's just a small little thing, kind of informal. I'd say we don't do anything more than that. And I will I will provide the hot dogs, and uh, I say I'll bring my Weber grill over. Uh, we'll have hot dogs, buns, some some condiments, and uh, I do a big big thing of uh, lemonade or something of that nature. Does that work? Hopefully, uh, we can get a little more advertising out because a lot of people weren't aware of uh, our little gathering there at the Commons and hot dogs. Bring the kids over, enjoy a few minutes, have a hot dog, talk to us about our bike path and things going on on the island. But uh, if I remember right, that's September 22nd? August. August 22nd. No, August, I think it's 18th or 19th. It's, okay. uh, it's that Saturday. I'd have to look at okay. my kit. But, uh, but Barry Van Eglund has... Uh, is going to uh, provide the entertainment for us. You know, perhaps on the, I, I, I don't know, uh, if, I don't know what, what dates Barry will be there, but, you know, the uh, um, Kathy at the Bishop's Cottage with the entertainment on, uh, uh, on Thursday, perhaps we could get a, get a few announcements in leading up to it. Just a thought, and especially if Barry's going to be there, I'm sure he'd, uh, he'd throw it out for us. And with the uh, upcoming rec department uh, uh, concerts on their greens in front of Smokies, uh, maybe the new director can say something about. Yeah, I believe it's August nineteenth. Right. You know, no. I want to. I want to. In my uh, liaison's report, I want to. I want to talk about uh, the rec department. So uh, yep. we'll save it for then. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. If there's no other uh, events we want to talk about. We can move right into the liaison's report. Ah, are you going to make the flyer? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> the advertising flyer. Walk the path. Well, I want to tell you, um, our new rec direct, our new rec director, is a real bombshell. She is. She's very businesslike. I believe that she is going to make a world of difference in the recreation department. She's just a super person. I really like her. I liked her from the first time I met her. I like her even more now. Um, I think that she is, would open her arms uh, to work with, uh, you know, be back as a commission. I know that she's uh, with the uh, the people that do kayaking and Kathy Walker's We Kayak. Uh, she has been very acceptable of the, the the kayakers down there and has has done things for us that uh, obviously she didn't have to do, but. Kim is uh, uh, Kim O'Farrell is a is a super person. I got to tell you, she's she's and I say she's a bombshell. She's a bombshell. She's a great person, and I think that uh, you know perhaps uh, you know le you know the concerts on the green leading up to the uh, uh, walk the path. You know that weekend, uh, I'll ask her. I'll talk to her if we can get a little little announcement out there. Great, but she's a uh, I can see. I can see teaming up with uh, uh, the rec department uh, for for certain, you know, different events, you know, uh, things that'll serve us both. And she's a person that will uh, take advantage, you know, full advantage of that. So I think it's going to be all good. But I will talk to Kim about it and see if we can, you know, and if uh, Kathy at Bishop's Cottage, if we can, because what what does it serve? It serves it serves the residents, right? You stop by, get a free hot dog, a little bit of entertainment, and conversation amongst friends so i'm gonna leave that go with that but uh thank you well i'll say uh miss uh, uh kim did a wonderful job today with the after school pool party considering the situation with the big pool not being open she utilized residents people and everything and made it work she did a great job today i if i could only tell you the story that went behind it she actually drove to indiana to pick up a pump she did for the pool she is, she's a dynamic lady. She really is. And she is going to make, I think teaming up with her uh, will benefit everybody. So. Great. Um, I'm going to forego my uh, chairman's report. There's not much fail for me to present. And... Getting dark. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> so we got a motion from Tom. A second. Bob, all in favor? Aye. Motion Aye. passes. The time is 9.35. Everyone walk, bike, and drive safe. Thank you and good